this meeting is being recorded, continue. All right, well, welcome everybody. We're so glad that you guys could join us today for our music talk and analysis of Beethoven's Appassionata Sonata. This is gonna be a fun time. I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, I'm Dr. David Mosier. Most of you uh, that are here already know me, but I'm sending my greetings uh, from Zoom land as you all are, and Dr. Kim. Hi, I'm Young Kim, and it's so nice to see you all virtually. And originally, we were uh, scheduled to do this in March, but everything locked down, and I'm so glad that we can do this virtually today. Uh, so happy to share this beautiful music and one of the most popular and beloved sonatas. And in fact, this was Beethoven's own favorite out of his 32 sonatas. The subtitle Appassionata uh, is Italian and it this translates to passionate. Uh, and this was not given by the composer, but later by publisher. Uh, as the title suggests, the sonata is very dramatic, passionate, and sometimes dark and intense, especially rhythmically. And the extreme use of the dynamics, so you'll be hearing a lot of subito forte and subito pianos throughout the piece. And the uh, Beethoven also uses the full range of the keyboard. So literally, you'll be hearing the last note to the top. And I hope uh, this is helpful to consider all these things while you're listening to the first movement. Very good. OK, so um, kind of for the order of things that we'll be doing today, we're going to listen to a performance done by Dr. Kim, which hopefully is showing up on the left hand side of your screens. And on the right hand side of your screen, you should actually see a score that we're going to follow along with. So that way you can kind of be tracking what's happening in both areas at the same time. Um, this was a performance given by Dr. Kim at the recent Camerata performance on November 8th. Uh, so uh, if you would, we'll just begin there. And after that, we'll delve into kind of the details of a, a fairly in-depth analysis, I think, and close with some pianistic applications. So let's go ahead and begin by listening to the performance as we follow along.
I'd like to acknowledge just a beautiful performance that that was by Dr. Kim. Um, very challenging piece, a very difficult piece, a uh, very beautiful piece. So I hope you all enjoyed uh, beginning with uh, the full performance of it as well. Um, let's go ahead and dig into uh, some of the notes. Hopefully some of these things just in seeing uh, kind of an annotated score, you begin to make some of the connections maybe ahead of time that we're going to draw attention to uh, during this time. Um, I'm going to switch over real quick to um, Muse Score for just a moment and highlight some of the relationships that are going to become running themes of this analysis. Um, and you see several of them here. Hopefully, does um, I guess I'll check in with Dr. Kim. Do you see what's on screen here in Muse Score? You yes. Okay. So I'm going to assume that everyone else can too. So the piece uh, opens in F minor, and that's kind of the home or global uh, key. Uh, that we're going to be looking at. And there's a particular interval that ends up being highlighted. Uh, we can refer to it as the minor second. We can refer to it as an interval class one. Sometimes that minor second gets expressed uh, with octave displacement, though usually not, uh, sometimes as a minor ninth. And then sometimes Beethoven is very specific in which minor seconds he's actually expressing. So there's kind of the notion of the general primacy of that interval. There's also the notion of which specific instantiations of that interval are happening. Um, one of them is in relation to the home note. Uh, so with F being the home note there, we see that this G flat is a half step above that home note. Um, that ends up being um, either a motive, a motive on um, the scale of kind of a note to note relationship which he also does in relationship with a D flat to C, another one that he highlights. Another um, instance of that half step that we see is between C and C flat. Um, and you may notice that all of these have to do with half steps around a tonic triad, right? So F minor being spelled F A flat C. Um, those notes are the ones where half steps are kind of being emphasized around those structural tones. So F as a home, as a home note, the half step relationship with it. C, the dominant, um, known from uh, kind of being a, a harmonic pull, uh, right, in classical music, we have a half step pull to the dominant from the D flat that gets emphasized motivically quite a bit. Also below it, which we see happening in parallel modes that we'll talk about in the secondary theme. Um, so that half step ends up being really important. This gets composed out on a number of levels, so not just the half step itself, but also the chords in relationship to those half steps, right? So if we're in F minor, F minor being the one chord, and then the major chord built on a half step above it. So what's called the Neapolitan triad, right? So the Neapolitan is a major chord built on a lowered second scale degree, in this case, G flat. So I've given you kind of a G flat chord here. It's most standard context is as a predominant going to the five, and then to the one. So let's hear that progression. Perfect, yeah, so in that context, if you're thinking in terms of a full phrase, you get the tonic, you get kind of this half step pull to the tonic from above it at the end of the phrase, and then also leading through the dominant below it. So a half step above, kind of with a magnetism to the tonic, a half step from below with a magnetism to the tonic. So that ends up being super important. Um, that same relationship can be mimicked in a minor mode from the uh, chord built on the lowered sixth scale degree or the sixth scale degree in minor, which also houses a major chord and can pull to the dominant. And so I've kind of put here in parentheses that it gives us that same half step pull to the root of the five. So I've kind of put it as uh, a type of secondary Neapolitan to the five, but in this case going directly to uh, the end of the phrase. Can we hear that? Right, so there's that half step up top, D flat to C, which becomes motivically charged. Um, we also have that same half step uh, kind of inherently happening here with F to E, again around a note of the tonic triad, and then A flat, the third of that tonic triad with a half step in relationship to it, kind of built within those chord structures. Um, we'll notice a lot that Beethoven will use parallel modes within this piece. Um, so if we could hear the difference between like an A flat major and an A flat minor chord. Okay, so again, the distinction being between the, the middle tone of that chord or key, if we're thinking 
Uh, we're moving from F minor to A flat major as an expectation, but he substitutes A flat minor. That third scale degree expectation is denied and you're given um, a half step below it only to have it resolved when we go to the, the expected key of A flat major. Um, another area that we'll kind of see as we're looking at the score that's super important to Beethoven in the sense that Beethoven is understood as a bridge from classicism into romanticism. Uh, and one of the trends that we start seeing in romantic music has to do with uh, harmonic and tonal areas in mediant relationships. So mediant relationships being third related, and this could be diatonic thirds, chromatic thirds, doubly chromatic thirds. In this case, we see two third related key areas that are super important to the piece. Uh, and that is F minor and D flat, whose roots are a third apart, featuring the half step C to D flat on top. Can we hear that? Yes, and he, he features this D flat as a key area that's supremely um, influential to the coda section of the piece and also interim movement. So the second movement starts in the key of D flat major, which we won't consider the second movement today, but just know that this resonance kind of goes beyond the first movement into the second movement as well, that, that relationship between F minor and D flat. So Beethoven's thinking beyond this movement in terms of these relationships. Um, and then maybe the more expected um, tonic key area to the relative major. Let's hear that, that mediate relationship. Okay, very good. Um, I'm gonna stop the share for just a minute and, and put a whiteboard up. Um, I want to make sure that for those of us who may not have had a lot of exposure to sonata form, and this is not a, this is not going to be a full scale lecture on all the details of sonata form. This piece is a sonata form and I wanna kind of frame it with some basic expectations we're not going to go into all the details of a sonata form there's just not time and i'm assuming we have a broad enough uh, group here that some will be familiar and, and some maybe less so uh, but the three major sections we're looking at uh, are the exposition development and recapitulation um, so this is just in general in terms of expect oh, this didn't come out well let me clear this drawing uh, so i'll just call it expo development and recap. Okay, so those are kind of the three main areas we're looking for. Within an exposition, it's common to expect um, four primary areas, potentially a primary theme area. So we'll, we'll unpack this with relation to this key, but typically this uh, happens in the home key. The job of the T or transition is to move us out of that home key, out of the primary theme area and into our secondary key or our S or secondary theme. Uh, and then often we'll find kind of more of a, a cadential sounding second section uh, considered the closing theme that closes off that exposition. So this is where all the ideas of the piece are typically exposed. Um, often you end in a, it, well you do, you end in a key that's not the home key. This is the job of the recap is to get us back home. Um, so within the recap, we can also expect to have these same things happen. What happens within a development though? Um, let me go ahead and open a new thing here. So we expect P, T, S, K to show up here with the job of closing in the home key. So our secondary key should be in the home key, or F minor in this case. Our closing should be in F minor. In the development, it's standard to expect things like fragmentation, tonicization, um, quick modulations, um, just exploratory elements that typically end with a dominant prolongation. So in this case, we're in the key of F minor, we're going to expect a C to show up as a pedal, per perhaps as part of a C uh, dominant seventh chord or something, bringing us back home to our home key of F minor in the recap so that we can close it out. So these are, these are just general expectations that you would have within a sonata form. Um, optional parts that composers might also include are an introduction, which this does not have, um, and a coda, which this has a considerable one. Um, and Beethoven's known in his middle period, this is a middle period piece, uh, for extending the forms, making them big, making them large and grandiose. And the coda is one of those things that uh, just is very, very large in this section, kind of makes the piece big. And really in this piece functions as a, a type of second development. He goes back through his themes yet again to close everything out, to wrap everything up. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share the score and we're going to walk through it together and um, 
hopefully this will be uh, helpful and fun. All right, so let's share screen and go to the score. Uh, the first thing that I'd like to uh, have Dr. Kim play for us is the primary theme, which you see happening right here, I'm circling it at, at the very beginning, and the secondary theme, which I'm going to point out to you here, happening here. Notice we change from bass to treble, so I'm going to point out a couple of things. Note the similarity of rhythm between the secondary theme and the primary theme. I point this out because in the coda, he actually fuses the two themes, and one way of doing that is having rhythms that are very similar or identical to one another. Uh, the primary theme is descending in its initiating uh, movement down through the tonic triad, 5-3-1 in F minor before it turns up. The secondary theme is ascending in its key, A flat major, C, E flat, and then we move to treble clef, A flat. So an ascending initial three notes through the tonic triad starting on scale degree three before it changes directions. So let's hear both of those. Secondary theme. Perfect. Yeah, so you can hear the rhythmic similarity, you can hear the arpeggiation that's happening, and you can hear the in initiatory uh, distinction and the directionality of that. Um, the second thing I want to point uh, attention to is, so if this is our primary theme area, all the way to kind of this dramatic moment here where we have uh, our fermata and we move into the transition, we haven't actually stayed in the home key. Beethoven sets us up after the first phrase to, to modulate this phrase modulation into the key of the Neapolitan, the key of G flat major in this case, and the flat two. So already at a tonal level, we see that half step kind of um, in relation to the home key before he pulls us right back into the tonic key area. So we can hear the beginning of that. And G flat. Yeah, so you hear the, the two keys kind of juxtaposed before he pulls you back in. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting about that, since you're starting on scale degree five in each phrase, he starts each phrase with a half step apart as well, of course, C to D flat, which then gets highlighted by itself. And with a particular rhythm that you all may have noticed, if you're familiar with the Fifth Symphony at all, this fate motive. Uh, and he composed his Fifth Symphony around the same time, a year or two later. Uh, and, and so you maybe can hear this swimming around in his head a little bit, uh, but here he's given it the half step association as well as kind of the ryth rhythmic motif with which we're all pro probably very familiar. So this is the fifth symphony. And here he goes. Right, so you can hear the similarity of that. You can also hear that he's drawing attention to it in that the texture changes. It's, it's sounded alone. Here it's sounded alone each time in different registers and it's given that half step association as well. So we kind of have all of those associations pointing that out saying, this is important, pay attention to this. And then we get it at the level of chord here at the, the ending of our primary theme. Can we hear this? The Neapolitan of the five moving to five or the six to five. Right, so the roots of those chords being that half step relationship as well. Um, then we move into the transition, and as we're again, remember the job of the transition is to move us out of the home key in a minor mode piece. Our expectations might be either to move to the minor dominant, C minor, or potentially the relative major, A flat major. So when we get to kind of this, this big half cadence uh, where we might expect what's called a medial caesura or a textural break, um, there's not a true um, break here. He actually kind of creates a pedal on the dominance of A flat at that point, but it's certainly texturally marked for our attention at that point. So we're expecting maybe to move to A flat major, but note that he doesn't. At uh, 25, 
he gives us this C flat up on top. He gives us this F flat moving down to E flat, another C flat moving to B flat. He's moved us into the parallel key of A flat minor. So a little bit of change to what a listener's expectations might have been. And the scale degree three is that half step distinction, right? In A flat major, we would have had a C natural. Uh, and the mode change, the darkening uh, note there would be C flat um, as a half step below the expected C natural. And again, F flat pulling half down, a uh, half step down to that E flat. So maybe we can hear going into that section. Right, perfect. So um, right tonic and wrong mode. And again, by wrong, I, I don't mean to indicate that there's anything wrong <laughs> with the composition. Absolutely not. But uh, just that our expectations are kind of going, wow, I didn't, I didn't necessarily expect to move to A flat minor. Finally, we arrive where we might expect, which is just before uh, the secondary theme. So we get the secondary theme here. We finally get A flat major. We get our C natural happening uh, down bottom and as the starting note of our secondary theme. So he kind of points that out and says, I know you wanted C natural. That's the tradition. Here it is. So let's hear the beginning of that secondary theme, maybe coming into it from the dominant. Perfect. No, that, so what, what's beautiful about that, I mean, many things are beautiful about that, but we start in the A-flat uh, major, so we're kind of going, yeah, that's where we thought we were going to be. I thought he took us to a different place than we expected to be, but we end up in the, the bright major mode for the secondary theme. And when he starts what looks like the parallel phrase, right, he starts it the same way, but it's beautiful what he does with the dynamics here in that you, you have this crescendo, and then all of a sudden he backs off to this piano and gives you the forte on the note that actually isn't in uh, A flat major, right? It's it's the F flat, that half step above E flat, uh, and gives it to you with a forte and then applies a Neapolitan chord in that situation. So again, kind of multiple levels of the half step taking you kind of off kilter just by a hair uh, and then emphasizes those half step motions of kind of drawing a couple of circles around them. In different places you get this a flat uh, minor descending scale that he fills in in places with half steps right here we have the whole upper tetrachord of e of a flat minor filled in with half steps here uh, so you've got a flat g g flat then the half step above e flat that's c flat above e flat etc uh, and then even at the turnaround where he kind of ends his scale and turns back around you get that E flat to F flat as you move in. So we end our closing uh, theme not in A flat major, but again in A flat minor, the darker minor mode sounding piece. And you get this kind of compound melody happening up here that a pianist would want to bring out to get that melody uh, to the listener with this C flat to B flat, that half step motion happening. Neapolitans coming back into the mix with these B double flats. Um, lots of half step motions here that I pointed out between half step above the five, half step below the one, uh, just re-emphasizing that. And then finally, closing out the exposition, um, he does give us this kind of dramatic, uh, this dramatic close, right? So we might expect a perfect authentic cadence, a strong cadence to close out our exposition, and we do get that. Um, but it's interesting to see the details of how he does that. So he actually gives us our root position five here where I've drawn this extra stem to point it out. So there's our E flat. Um, and then we get our one right after it, but that's really not dramatic enough for Beethoven, right? This E flat up here 
A flat here. So what he does is kind of transfer registers, right? He gives you this, um, in a way, a plagal walk down. Four, three, two, one, drop an octave. Four, three, two, one, drop an octave. Four, three, two, one. To bring that low end down and give you this wide registral expanse until you get to this low A flat down here. Uh, which, as Dr. Kim uh, noted, the piano of his day would have gone to an F, just a minor third below this. Uh, so he's at the low end of his register. And then also uh, transfers up wide in the right hand as well, right? So um, we end up with the A flat on top, scale degree one. That's technically our PAC, but not good enough for Beethoven. We've got to go up to this A flat in the upper register and sound it again and again and again and again until we finally get the bass down in this wide wingspan for the pianist. Maybe we can hear this section. That's great. Um, you'll notice I put a little parentheses around here. I think it's great that he's he's descending through the tonic triad and it's a minor tonic triad. So this is five, three, one. It's his head motive. It's the motive of the first three notes of the primary theme. It's just kind of so Listeners, remember this. This is what it's about. Uh, then he did so that's a great I mean that's that's how he closes out his exposition we move into the development with with a little switch here so we were in a flat minor he uh, changes on the page into a G sharp minor triad so a flat minor being a flat C flat E flat here we have G sharp B uh, D sharp happening down here let's hear let's hear the difference between a flat minor and G sharp minor <laughs> So obviously, no no difference to the listener, but what it allows him to do is then uh, change, as you heard Dr. Kim do, from this D sharp as he arpeggiates an E major chord, using the D sharp as a leading tone to that E. I've stemmed these for you all to see that half step relationship, moving us into E major, right? Uh, which, if you keep track of our global tonic, this is a half step. E is a half step below F, our home key. So even at this composed out uh, level, we have that half step as, as supreme. Um, as we move through, uh, you'll notice this key signature change, uh, which might give us, I put expectations here. Well, an expectation in, in a theory class, I might say, what, is, what does that mean? C major or A minor is what I would be expecting as an answer for that. Uh, but notice this concept that we're going to return to um, and I don't know whether to call this um, too long or out of sync, but I'm going to use both of those terms to express the fact that maybe that this is um, giving the performer the expectation of one of the other, C major or A minor, and yet we continue in E major for some time. Um, the cancellation of these accidentals actually happens here, pickups to uh, 79, where you see him using naturals. And what he's done, though, initially is, is still kind of uh, not necessarily what we might have expected. He's moved not to C major or E minor, I mean A minor, but to E minor, the parallel minor, which again highlights the distinction between the half step in parallel modes, G sharp versus G natural. Let's hear uh, kind of the phrase leading into E minor, so we can hear G sharp versus G natural. Mm -hmm. And one thing that when he does that uh, parallel major to minor, he often brings us like subito forte, like shocking forte, like same thing that happened in second theme to the closing theme, A flat major to A flat minor, same thing in here.
much happening in there. So much happening in there. So you get to E minor here and you finally get this dominant seventh chord, this G7. You're like, okay, finally, my key signature over here is going to conform. I, you know, see no accidentals going on here. Now we've got to be in C major. But what does he do when he resolves the chord? He gives you C minor, the parallel minor. So notice that theme, right? We've had expectation of A flat major. We got A flat minor. Um, key signature change for C major when we're in E we get the parallel minor E minor uh, we expect C major here we get C minor the minor dominant so and again that E flat versus E natural is the distinction in, in the mode uh, so he's doing that with us kind of keeping us on our toes about all of this um, you finally get to A flat major so the key of uh, the secondary theme the relative major but look how it's out of sync with Another key signature change. So your expectation here might be, okay, well, maybe he's going to go ahead and put this and we're going to go on an A flat major, but you don't. In fact, the very next note you get is A natural, which kind of conflicts with this key signature, yes? So you have a battle, I'm thinking of it metaphorically as a battle, going on between A natural, A flat, A natural, A flat. This is kind of the extreme register going on here, and you can hear that half step. Um, uh, Kind of play that's going on in the low register keep in mind right an a flat wins now if i were to say why does a flat win well it's the third of the tonic triad of the piece right it's a composing out of that f minor triad uh, that represents the ton the home chord of the piece uh, so a flat finally wins notice at this point we're in d flat major right so connect that to f minor our home key uh, this is a mediant relationship. So something uh, that we see mediant relationships as being more common uh, in romantic music. And so he's kind of moving into these mediant relationships. And this D flat, again, in relation to C, we can see tonally this half step motion. I didn't mean to draw on that between C and D flat, kind of at a zoomed out level, we see the half step happening there as well. Um, as we fast forward, you can kind of see um, half-step relationships between chords, more Neapolitans. Uh, we can see half-steps happening uh, here at the note level. Uh, and then we finally get uh, the secondary theme treated. I do want to uh, note the logic of the development. The first thing treated in the development was the primary theme. Second thing treated was the transition. Now we're on into the secondary theme. So he takes these in the development in order. Uh, and then we get this wonderful D flat major for the secondary theme, which we'll notice D flat major and the secondary theme come back in the coda when we get to the end of the piece. So that resonance happens as well. Let's hear the secondary theme in D flat. Again, uh, uh, Dr. Moshe will explain, but D flat, it, he develops this to by ascending all these left hand and the chord progression goes up, B flat minor to G flat major and Wonderful. So much going on here as well, right? So um, we hear the D flat major. The next move that he makes at the half cadence is to go to its relative minor, right? Uh, and then you get this kind of deceptive motion at the end of this phrase. So you hear, hear it go on in B flat minor, but then we end on what in B flat minor would be the sixth. So there's kind of a deceptive cadence. And he actually uses it as a pivot chord to go into the key of the Neapolitan globally, right? So if F minor is our home key, G flat is the key of the Neapolitan. So again, highlighting at a zoomed out tonal level that half step relationship. Um, he changes on the page, listener wouldn't hear this, but he changes it to um, F sharp major in order to act as a dominant of B minor. B minor quickly moves to G. The only difference in notes between these two chords is F sharp to G. So again, highlighting that half step motion. 
He treats that as a dominant to C. We're finally in the place where we could go back home, right? This is F minor. So we think, all right, we're ending the development. We have a dominant pedal. This is what I'm expecting to see right before going home into the recap. Uh, but he passes it, notice. He takes the C natural that we've expected and, and it's ringing out down there in the bass and he goes up a half step to this D flat. So the listener, to my mind, hears the dominant pedal go on even as he arpeggiates the upper structure of a dominant seven with a flat nine. Can we hear that chord? All right, so you hear the, that minor ninth kind of jamming up there. Your C, you have to imagine as the dominant pedal that you're expecting to happen. You get the upper structure of that chord arpeggiated up to the D flat, right, where I have my mouse pointer, etc. And you don't get the return of the C until the fate motive comes back. So you get D flat, D flat, D flat. You were expecting a C because originally the fate motive was D flat C. So where is it? Well, you want it, but you don't get it as a listener until here. Let's hear that, uh, that section with the fate motive moving into the recap. <laughs> Yeah, perfect. Um, the other thing I'll note, I've circled this C. So we get our dominant pedal, but it's kind of out of sync. Um, what do I mean by out of sync? Well, we expected it all during here and we expect it to go away at the recap, but it doesn't. It sits underneath uh, the recap for a good while and then changes key as well. I'm going to let uh, Dr. Kim talk about this from a pianist perspective very, uh, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, this is kind of unusual uh, recap because we don't need dominant pedal there. Uh, he does that uh, the very beginning with two hands, two octaves apart, this main theme. And he brings that to the right hand in octave with the dominant pedal. And as we uh, talk, as Dr. Mosher talked about it, uh, this is um, compound meter 12-8. And for us, we of course count four beats, but for a pianist, uh, this rhythmic intensity, actually what I mentioned, was throughout the piece, we have to feel this as an inner pulse. And believe it or not, we practice with metronome throughout the piece, and we set the actually tempo with the recap, which is very low here and somehow awkward position but we set the tempo here to do the beginning and that's a little challenge for pianists to do pianissimo in that recap and very special. Thank you, Dr. Kim. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, go to another point that I think is super important here and I'll try to pick up the pace a little bit with time. Uh, I wanna respect everyone's time as well and we do have a, a little bit more to cover. Um, I want to point out what happens here at this moment. I put D flat seven and G seven. Why have I done that? Well, this has to do with a lot of half steps converging in the same space. Um, if we're arriving on the C major chord right here, C, E, and C, what we actually hear is a half cadence here in G flat major. So on a D flat chord, right? But the D flat, after he sounds it on the downbeat, he gives you a tritone. Well, this tritone to the listener is the same tritone in a D flat seven chord as it would be in a G seven chord. Can we hear those two chords? Yeah. So the tritones in those two chords are the same. Um, so while a listener might hear a D flat seven going on, it's actually used as kind of a bait and switch, right? Uh, jazz musicians much later would have called this a tritone substitute. Uh, but we get a half step from the root going down our D flat to C motion. Uh, we get a B, the leading tone, going up a half step to C, so surrounding it on both sides. And then we get the seventh of that chord, if we're thinking of G7, uh, but we get the F going down by half step to an E. So it's like he's fused the Neapolitan with the dominant into the same chord uh, to go into the C. Correct, yeah. Um, when we move on into the transition, we see that he has moved into the parallel major mode. So again, putting that A flat versus the A natural into um, juxtaposition. Uh, I'm going to 
push on a little bit. We see uh, more of the Neapolitan of the five half-step relationship going on. And we actually get the secondary theme this time in F major. So he keeps the tonic like we would expect in the recapitulation to stay home as far as the tonic and the secondary theme, uh, but changes modes for us. So this time we get A flat versus the A natural. We don't get it in F minor yet. Um, pushing ahead with that, um, when we get to the closing theme area, we go into the parallel minor. So finally, if you want to think of it this way, A flat wins from the home triad, A flat, uh, F, A flat, C as part of the one chord. So we hear the closing theme stated on the minor uh, in the minor key. And we close the recapitulation the same way that we did uh, with the, the uh, exposition with this dominant in root position to the tonic we see him send that scale degree one up to the top and use it consistently all the way to the end and notice he has that same walk down from four scale degree four to one drop an octave four to one drop an octave four to one and he could have ended the piece right here right reminding you of that f minor triad motive that opened the piece but he actually uses that as an overlap to move into the coda with his primary theme. So let's kind of hear that section as we move into the coda. So we see in the coda, he moves to that D-flat major, another median relationship, and kind of foreshadowing the key of the second movement, which is going to be in D-flat. And we get the secondary theme treated again here at bar 210, pickups to 211, um, as if we're going through a, a, secondary, a second development of the theme, but this time in D-flat major. He doesn't stay there long, however, and he moves to C major, so again, I find it interesting, if you look at these key relationships in the coda, it's as if he's summarizing, which makes sense. He's gone F minor, D flat, the half step above the five, move to the key of the five, just briefly to remind you at a tonal level of that half step relationship, and then goes back home. Uh, but then immediately moves to the Neapolitan to remind you of that relationship. So tonally, he very quickly summarizes those important half steps. Uh, moving on, I do want to maybe hear this section. So this is kind of a dramatic section as he's bringing everything to a close. Uh, I've stemmed down this walk up that happens through F uh, harmonic minor, and he walks up from the D flat, which is important, all the way up to the D flat, which we expect to move down to C. But again, this concept of overreaching or uh, going too far, if you want to call it that, he goes to the D. So the listeners by this point are going, yeah, I know the D flat goes down to C, but he doesn't. He takes it to D before moving back to the dominance of C, dropping the octave, only to reassure us with the fate motive. No, it was about the D flat to the C. And then he gives you that several times before going into the pure allegro. Maybe we could hear that walk up. So this walk up is the bass. This is measure 222. Uh, yeah. Perfect. All right, so we get into the Pio Allegro, the last uh, part of the coda, and we get the secondary theme, this rising gesture, 
finally in the home key. So remember before he stated it, it was an F major. We needed it in F minor. Uh, he states it in D flat major. He finally gives it to us in the home key here, starting with the A flat. So A flat wins in that sense. Um, but he kind of derails it again in order to highlight on top that G flat and F, like Neapolitan to the tonic, and restates it again, Neapolitan to the tonic. And notice that here comes that dominant prolongation again. He sets that C up on top and puts it into relationship with the D flat. Uh, and I've stemmed these for you. He even does this all the way to the last measure of the entire piece to where maybe a listener might be asking themselves, now, hang on, if we're gonna have a strong, you know, perfect authentic cadence close on the tonic up top, how is this happening? Uh, what he does is fuse the primary and secondary themes at this point. What do I mean by fuse? Well, notice we're in F minor, the key of the primary theme. We're starting with the upward gesture on the third scale degree, which is um, indicative of the secondary theme, right? So we have elements of both. And then as we turn down, I've kind of put in par par uh, parentheses for you, this gr uh, grouping of three notes going five, three, one, five, three, one, five, three, one, which is coming from our primary theme, right? That descending uh, three note motive in the minor and reminds you of that head motive all the way to the very last note. So you've got tonic in the low register, you climb to tonic in the upper register, which connects with it, and then all of this that you hear going on on the right hand is inner voice motion that finishes out the piece. So maybe we can hear a little bit of the, uh, from maybe 256 to the end to hear that dominant, and then moving into that fused theme. <laughs> So much gravitas to this piece and to that moment and to that lowest note on the keyboard, the, the wide expanse. All right, thank you. I'm gonna turn this over uh, to Dr. Kim to talk just a little bit about pianistic uh, uh, application as we wrap. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Mosier, for your great work. And I'm uh, just very grateful that um, I had this great opportunity to collaborate and study with you. And it was such a wonderful learning experience for me. And, and as a pianist, we do analyze, but not much like this in depth. And this really has changed my perspectives on this sonata and uh, helped, of course, my performance uh, tremendously. Thank you and as a pianist, <laughs> yeah, most frequent uh, questions that I get from people would be that, how do you memorize all these music? Like, how do you do that? And of course, like uh, when we're memorizing these lengthy pieces, like 30 minute long, like an hour, you just can't rely on your muscle memory. So um, we don't just memorize rhythm and notes, but in my mind, I have my own like this diagram of this uh, form, in this case, the sonata form. So I have to know where I am when I'm playing like recap or coda. And also um, in, in my mind, I follow these things along with key relations and then tonal schemes and all these. Yes, we follow that. And when I start the beginning, I follow, okay, I'm in F minor first theme, going into the second theme, A flat. And before that, of course, we have that E flat section dominant of that A flat so for a while. And then going into moving into uh, the... Uh, a flat minor so all these like physically we're playing but my mind is busy like following these uh, details and it's such a journey to perform and when they're asking so is the theory skill really necessary yes it is and it's it's really like impossible to memorize all these pieces without having this basic theory skills and I do want to continue working this way. And also to all the student musicians, I really suggest that you uh, approach this way. And if you have any questions, of course, you know, uh, you can ask your theory teachers and applied teachers and we'll be happy to work with you. And this will really benefit your own performance. Thank you very much.
Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, we just want to take a second and say thank you to all of you guys that were able to make it to today's session. It's been wonderful having you here. Um, I do want to say you can go ahead and send any questions that you might have uh, to mosierd at stros.edu or uh, to Dr. Kim's uh, email as well, kimy at uh, stros.edu. We'd be happy to field any questions. We hope you've had a wonderful time and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Bye, guys.